Hi, this is Dennis with Second Chance Tackle. Today I have the opportunity to work on one of the flea market finds from Scott. This is a big one. It's in very nice condition. It is the Daiwa 7850RL. This one is what I call beautiful reel that is grease choked. So it's probably been in storage a long time. You can see how much effort I need to to just kind of turn the handle on this one, but it does turn. And uh, well, it's kind of got a couple of interesting features. One of them is the instant anti reverse override. It's this little push button here that enables you to have the anti reverse. You can hear click, click. I think you push it out again. Oh, you push it from the other side. Push it from the other side, then you can pedal the reel backwards. Kind of a fun little feature on this reel. We're going to take this reel apart. We're going to clean up all those greases and oils and the like that's keeping this thing from maximizing its performance. We'll show you how the reel was made, how to service it, and how to keep it going for a while. And while well, if the opportunity comes up, maybe we'll even talk about what to look for in uh, flea markets. That's where Scott uh, found this one out on the West Coast. And uh, well, a little bit about pricing and the like. So this one is a reel from the uh, probably the late 1970s. It's got a metal case. It'll tell you that it was engineered and developed by Daiwa Corporation. And that's an interesting little tag on the bottom. I'm reading that from the bottom of the spool here. And it says assembled in Japan. And uh, sometimes you're going to find Sears Roebuck reels. They'll have that same inscription underneath here. So a lot of times these reels were rebadged as a Sears uh, reel. And uh, just keep an eye on it. One of the telltale signs on this usually is that I always put this on here, the anodized spool, salt water corrosion protection kind of uh, a little label there. So look for that. And if you see that, even though it may be badged King Neptune or something else, take a look. You may find out that underneath here, it's got a little note on here that it's a Daiwa reel and it's basically the same components inside. All right, let's start by taking this reel apart. And if I was to buy this reel from a, uh, at a flea market, I would give it uh, high marks for the cosmetics and low marks for the performance. And so, of course, as you want to haggle with the flea market vendors, one of the things you would want to do is to bring up, hey, I can't even turn this reel. Come on, you got to be kidding me. It's going to need a full service and uh, try to get some kind of a uh, uh, price concession based on that. Well, we can see there's a lot of chunky grease on here. It's interesting, it's it's oily. And uh, that usually doesn't happen on something that's been dried out. So what may have happened, this is just pure speculation, of course. I don't know, reels can't talk. Uh, somebody may have just pulled that screw on the other side, tried to put a squirt of oil in there or something. They tried to loosen it up and realized they couldn't do that. Well, they should have watched my video. They would have seen that, uh, well, we show how to take these things apart, how to service them, how to clean them up, and how to get them going good as new again. And, uh, well, they may have been able to sell it for a few dollars more than, than what they, uh, they got here. Well, if you like these types of videos, if you like to learn those kinds of things, I encourage you to subscribe to my channel. And if you do subscribe to my channel, please use that notification button. That'll let you know when I'm posting. And, uh, well, you can make a decision as to whether that's a video you want to watch or not. Okay, well, we took off the two biggest components. Let's take off the side case now that's going to give us access to the gears. There's three Phillips head screws that are holding the case on. When I take these pieces and parts off, I like to put them into a parts tray. And my parts tray just happens to be the bottom of a fast food container. I recommend that you have a system for handling the parts when you remove them. It's always a good practice to know where you're putting the pieces. And I recommend not putting the pieces onto a desk. Uh, but also um, keeping them segregated so that you know sub-assembly wise where some of those pieces and parts belong and then of course uh, being able to have access to them when it's time to reinstall. These three screws have been removed. We should be able to remove the side plate now. There we go. And one of the things you're going to notice about this reel is it's got a spiral drive. And that's, uh, well to me that's a step up in engineering and it's uh, always an example of good quality engineering. I just had somebody looking for this little ring. 
How do you like that, right? Well, that ring belongs on the crosswind gear here. And, uh, well, it just was lodged in that crosswind block. And the next thing you know, you can lose that. And it's going to be very difficult to replace. You can't get pieces and parts on a reel this age. You're going to have to look for a donor reel. And if you do find that donor reel, uh, well, it may not have the part that you need. So uh, just be cautious about what you do with the real pieces and parts as you take them off to ensure that you don't have to go to the secondary market somewhere to, uh, to get that replacement. Well, we talked about grease trapping and grease choking. Here's a good example of that. That's, uh, that's thicker than mud. It's, it's congealed. It's old grease. And it's sort of like you uh, trying to trudge through a muddy environment. I'm going to use a flat bladed screwdriver to kind of just work my way around that. This is in nice condition. I don't want to scrape anything up, so I'm using this as kind of just a flat blade by itself. I'm using a penetrating oil to soften the dirt. And uh, we're going to pull that up right now. Scott, you have a beautiful reel here. This one is going to run really nice. And uh, I hope you take it fishing on your uh, excursions out there. Okay. We noticed as we were cleaning that case off that there is a uh, washer that's going to go in front of the bushing. And it's going to sit on this main gear here. With the main gear, all we should have to do right now is just pull that out like that. And here's the other piece, right? So always a fun thing to comment on this. This is why you can't turn the main gear. You've got an, a quarter of an inch or so of solidified grease that as you were trying to crank it, uh, it had to plow through in order to get there. I'm just going to use that screwdriver again. I use a paper towel on my desk to... to deposit the stuff that comes off because I don't want to transfer it right to that board and then have the next project be uh, absorbing all that old dirty grease in the lake. That's the first step. Now I'm going to just spray that with that penetrating oil again. I'm using WD-40 today but I don't have a preference for, for penetrating oils. I use them as degreasers not as lubricators and uh, well I just let it soak and do its job put that over there right with that piece and uh, we'll move on to the next part. The next part is well we can go any any number of ways. There's no set requirement to do it one way or another. We still have a, a bunch of old grease on the back of the case here and that's gravity. That's gravity working its way. You saw how it just puddled on the bottom of this reel and it puddled there because of the way it was stored and I don't remember where that main gear was but if you're storing a reel kind of laying it like this all of the greases that are in the reel are going to deposit themselves well, where gravity takes them. I'm going to take the cross wind block off now and pull that axle shaft. And that will enable me to get inside the case by removing the rotor. Again, you want to take the pieces and parts and have an organization place for them. I know my hand's in the way here, but I don't want to lose this screw. Then when I get that gear out of there, we'll show you how that anti-reverse works, because it's kind of fun. Now you want to pull up on your axle shaft and out. And again, look at the strength it takes to get this out, which says that we just have a ton of dried grease on that axle shaft. Any questions about performance can be answered right there. i take the long threaded screw that I just had out of the cross wind block. Wipe that off. So where did all that grease in the case come from? Well, it was probably on here because there's nothing here. That means that that worked its way down. And now we should be able to come up top here and remove the rotor. So there's a, um, I'm going to say it's a 12 millimeter. I'm not quite sure. It might be 13. Probably a 13, of course. I'm going to go see if we can find the socket for that. It's going to be a 14. Wow. So I keep all my, my um, deep sockets close by. You need a deep socket in this one because the lip on that case is too deep to allow you to get an open end wrench in there. Put the socket on, get it into release mode. This should come out in the left hand turn, it does. 
I said that because I see that there's a little tag that's holding the rotor here and a little clip that will hold the rotor nut. This is a good place to tell you to take pictures. As you start to remove these pieces and parts, you want to know the orientation of these parts so that when you go to reinstall, if there is any questions, you can answer those uh, with a view back to the picture. For example, let's say for some reason you remove the trip lever here. You can see that there's a spring with a tag that's on the base of this trip lever here. That's the one arm of it. It probably circles this screw twice, comes over and the other tag in, rests in the bowl on the side. Well, if you would remove that, it's real easy to try and, uh, or it's real easy to forget what that's all about. Before I attempt to take the rotor off, I'm going to just squirt the side of the pinion gear. Hopefully that will enable me to pull up and out on the rotor. There we go. Up and out on the rotor. I noticed that there was a little bit of uh, um, corrosion going on on that piece, so I wanted to take care of that. Let's see if that can mop off or not. Now that's, that's a little bit of pitting on that steel piece. That should come off now. Now let's take that off. Wipe it down, find the right place for that. I'll put that with the nut and the tie down screw. You do not need to remove the bale unless the bale is not working. So I'm just going to use that penetrating oil again on the seams around that trip lever and over on the side that has the, uh, the piece. Work it in and let's just put that on the side. And just to keep the parts in central, I'm going to put the spool from that back there. I didn't mean to. Uh, to ignore the heavily uh, greased up and dried up axle shaft. So I'm going to put a little bit of that on. I'm going to use 4 out steel wool. It's a polishing steel wool. Slightly abrasive. Don't use it on painted finishes and the like. You will mar the surface on it. But for something like this to clean off the old grease and restore the uh, smoothness on that shaft, it's perfect. Okay, got that off. Wipe up a little bit at the top. Notice that there is a Teflon washer at the base of the axle shaft here. And put that into my parts tray. Next up, we want to remove the three pieces, three screws that are holding our uh, pinion gear in. I want to be able to show you how this little thing works here. It's pretty cool. Uh, two Phillips, a bigger screw, bigger screw points to your real seat. And always want to make sure, as you notice this stuff, uh, where the, um, the alignment is of this because it will affect the bail trip. If you're not paying attention and you go to put this in a different location, your bail casting and uh, tripping will act differently. Trying to find the right screwdriver head for this one. You don't want to use an undersized head. Uh, screw, uh, screwdriver, you can strip the threads. And if you strip those threads, you may not be able to get the part off. Okay, that's two small ones. And then we have a flat-headed screw for the top one. And that's holding the ramp. And what I'm going to do here, these look like they're equally spaced. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that I leave that screw and ramp in that plate just like that, just in case there's some kind of issue when I go to reinstall. One very big bearing here. Let's see if we can get this assembly out. Okay, it looks like this should come straight up and out because we have the, uh, there we go, we have the star that's going to catch the um, anti-reverse. Pull that bearing out. It's a rubberized bearing. It's still working nicely. Very good. Hooray for them. We have the collar underneath that bearing. And then we have the dried grease on the pinion gear. Let's go ahead and do the same thing we've been doing with the others, which is to spray that down. I'm going to get a soft brush and I'm going to pull it through. See how nice it cleans that right up? Yeah, again, when you have a grease choked wheel, you got to take all precautions to get that old grease out of there. It will be a uh, have a negative effect on your performance. Now let's get this towel out of the way. 
I think Scott's going to send me some more paper towels. He usually wraps his reels in paper towels and they become a uh, resource for fixing his reels. I don't go through the whole uh, piece. That's just a joke, Scott. All right. That's, but there's truth in that joke. Look at that beautiful gear. That's probably brass. Just checking. There's a couple of spots on this gear that, again, gravity worked. That uh, The grease flowed down to the lowest point. So I would say that that was probably um, sitting this way and all the grease collected here. So I just want to, again, use that, use the penetrating oil to soften it. And now I'm using a little pick or an awl or a little Harbor Freight uh, multi-packs for $1.99 or whatever they are. Just want to make sure all of them get clean because if they don't, the reel is not going to turn easy. You're going to get a thump thump when you come into something like this that has a uh, level amount of grease in those teeth. Same thing we'll do here that we did with the other one. I'm going to take that soft brush and pull through the channels of the main gear. Okay. Almost done with the cleaning. There's just one more piece that needs to be addressed, and that's the case. But I did want to show you as we were doing this why your anti-reverse works the way it does. Always fun. Let's see if we can get that little dirt out of there. Okay. So this is your anti-reverse button that you're pushing. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to see this or not. I hope we can see that. It's tapered. On this side, you have a narrow taper. On this side, you have a very wide cone. When you have the wide cone, it uh, pulls the tab in. And when you go for the taper, the spring is going to push this dog forward, as you can see there. And that's what's going to make the difference in how this reel performs. I'm going to spray that down just to make sure that that button continues to slide nice and easily. And uh, we'll go about reassembling the reel. So let's take the assembly for the pinion gear first. We're going to use fishing reel grease. I only recommend fishing reel grease. I use pen precision reel grease when I grease up my uh, fishing reel parts. I don't have a preference for whose fishing reel grease as you are, but I do have a preference that you use fishing reel grease. I use an artist brush to load the grease. I like that because it doesn't transfer the hairs into the project. And uh, those of you who watch my old video also know that I use a screwdriver from time to time to spread the grease. Of course, if I'm using a screwdriver, it's not going to transfer the hairs in either, is it? Okay. Let's put that off to the side for a moment. And let's put this case back together. We have the pinion gear, the collar, and the main bearing. That bearing's sealed. You don't need to, to uh, put any oils on it. It won't go in. And let's take that whole assembly and work that through. Make sure that you seat that into the, the hole in the case here. And make sure it's flush on top. If it's not flush on top, you haven't seated it properly, stop back and do that. Let's take the tie down assembly with the big screw that goes in the back. Start there. That way you know you have it right. That's a flathead screw so let's go ahead and put that back in. And if you have any questions on this reel or any reel in particular, if you want to leave those questions in the uh, comment section, I will try to answer those for you. Now, it can be on any reel, it doesn't have to be on this one. Maybe you you like these vintage reels, you'd like to see more. Maybe you have one that you own, and maybe you uh, would like to see how that's serviced. And I have a lot of these in the library, but if I don't have one in the library and I get one in my shop, or maybe even have one in my shop somewhere, um, I'll try to do the video, show you how to do it yourself. Generally speaking, these uh, reels follow about two or three different types of uh, architectures or design. And if you figure out the one, you can generally figure out uh, figure them all out. Okay, 
We're going to uh, take the main gear now. This is one of those pieces, if you were wondering how it went, you go back to your uh, pictures and see. There's two sides to this main gear. It's easy to forget which one is out and which one is in. So if you took pictures, you'd have the answer. All right, back drive first. That's going to drive the oscillation gear that sits on the other case. Greases into the main. Make sure you get a good amount on there. Don't be afraid that it's going to puddle when it sits in storage. Get it done properly. Okay. That goes in so that we can drive the uh, crosswind block. I'm going to take the little washer that I've had stored here now and put that on so that I don't forget that as I go to the next step. On the next step, we want to put a little bit of grease onto the stud where our crosswind block rides. Got the crosswind gear a little bit onto the back. This is an aluminum gear. Nothing wrong with aluminum gears. A lot of them will use plastic gears today. All right, so we get it on everything. We get it on the teeth, on the side, and on the face. And then we can put that over the stud here for the back side of this. And then what we need next is we need that axle shaft to come through. We've cleaned that. Just a very light case coating of the grease. And then just set that aside for a moment as we go to reinstall the rotor. I'm going to hold the main gear so I don't knock the rotor off. The bowl itself is clean. If it's not, make sure that you go in there and take care of cleaning it up. Do your, uh, your household work. Locate that stud for your tie down. And then locate the two flat sides of the uh, pinion gear. Actually, it's one. It's a D shape. And then what you have to do is hold your pinion gear, turn the bowl until those two prongs, look like serpent's uh, teeth, line up and go around the sides of that stud. And take the rotor nut. Oops, there's one more that was an oops. There is that little uh, tension retaining washer. It's going to hold that nut from spinning. Another advantage to having a parts tray, you can look over there and say, wait a minute, I didn't install that piece yet. Or that's, that's what's left to do either way. All right, th switch the throw on your ratchet. Tighten it down. And now we can go ahead and grab the axle shaft, slide that through the pinion gear, bring it down, and then that has to merge in with our crosswind block. And when it merges in with our crosswind block, that hole there needs to align with the hole inside. Kind of hard to do this over the camera sometimes, but we'll see what we can do here to figure that out. Okay, you probably can't see it, but by using the pick, I'll show you that we go through. And then we have that long Phillips head screw, which is going to tie the two together. That's a long screw. All right. Next up, we'll do a little bit of grease onto the face of this crosswind gear and onto the slide which is going to ride up and down on. This is the slide so I'm just going to take it out of the way and put a little bit of grease on that. Grease into the track because that's where that stud is going to ride and grease onto the face because that's going to ride on the face of the crosswind gear here. Okay we got two things to do now. We got to load this stud so that it rides in the track. We also got to get this piece through and I think Probably the best thing to do is keep this thing all the way out on this side so that we can pick that uh, little stud up before we go much further. 
is that there is a spring behind there. Then load to the side and then you need to eyeball to the stud in the crosswind block. With the case set, before you start tying, tying screws or anything down, make sure you got it lined up here that all of the seams are nice and tight and spin the reel to see, oh it's spinning nicely already, that it's going up and down. There's no sense putting the screws in to find out that you did not align that stud on the crosswind gear with the slot in the crosswind hole. Let's grab our screwdriver then. We'll tighten these three back in. I have no doubt this reel is just going to fly. It's a beautiful reel. We saw the causes of the issues with the dried grease, what I call grease choked. And uh, I have no, no doubt, Scott, that you're going to take this one on a boat and be the envy of the folks that uh, are kind of asking, what is it? Of course, you're going to have to deal with that click, 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 because that's what this is going to make. It's going to make a hammer click. It's not the silent anti-reverse of the more modern reels. Okay, one more thing to do before we go back and test, and that's to check out what's going on with the drag washers here. Daiwa had a habit of using felt washers. They also used um, Teflon washers in a lot of their spinning wheels. I'm not quite sure which one is which, what we'll see today. But you do need to check these out. There's no sense taking this out on a boat. Going to uh, fight the fish and find out that, uh, well, the drags are shot. In this case, we only have one. <laughs> okay, well, they must be very happy with the one washer that they have, but you don't get a lot of max drag with this one. Just trying to fish this out. You want to clean the cavity behind here. Get all the old dirt and grease out of there because that will compromise drag performance. We only have one washer, so I would say max drag on this reel is very low. Maybe three or four is your washer that goes back in. And then we put the retaining clip back in, put that on. We do have a washer down here, but that's more about spool height. You can see it's not going to press anything here, so it's not going to help with the max drag at all. Let's align that. Go ahead and put the adjuster knob back on. We'll put the handle back on. We'll see how we did. Well, again, if you like these types of videos, I know I encourage you to subscribe earlier. I'd like to repeat myself and encourage you to subscribe. If, uh, if you've been kind of following the whole video now, I think you have an interest in these types of things. And again, a subscription and a notification. Uh, well, they'll let you know when I'm posting. And I post on all kinds of reels. This one happens to be a vintage saltwater reel. Tomorrow, maybe a low profile bait caster. I might be working on the, the latest lever drag. We never know. Find the screwdriver that fits the slot to tighten that. Again, you don't want to butterfly these reels. And uh, let's see how we did. Well, look at this. Huh? Talk about a nice, smooth, easy cranking fishing reel. That's this one. Let's use that fun little thing here. Let's get that anti reverse working. There you go, Scott. They know when you got one on the line now when you're working that reel. Make sure your bail trips. Nothing less expected, and that's it. That's how you service your Daiwa 7850RL. Beautiful reel. And I uh, had fun doing that. I always have fun working on these vintage reels. So, before I go, I want to thank our first responders and essential personnel for everything it is that you do to keep us safe. I truly appreciate your dedication to task and your uh, helping us stay safe. To everyone, Enjoy the art of reel repair. Don't be afraid of these older reels. Take lots of pictures. Make sure that uh, you have a good organization system for your parts that you remove. Be careful. Take your time. There's no rush in reel repair. And, uh, well, you're going to find that you're going to have a lot of these that you want to take out. See how they perform in the real world. And uh, catch some fish while you're at it. This is Dennis with Second Chance Tackle. Wishing everybody a great day.